que todo mundo. Okay, good morning. I hope you can hear me. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on creating synergy between fintech players and regulators. My name is Janet John, and I work as a tech analyst at Nyrometrics. This webinar is hosted by Nyrometrics. Nyrometrics is a leading financial service company based in Nigeria with special focus on financial literacy and investor advocacy. We've seen how FinTech has transformed the many services that we use from providing seamless loan services to an easy payment process, buying foreign stocks and the rest. FinTech has taken center stage in everything and has made itself indispensable to customer facing processes. But all this transformation has come on the back of heavy regulations from government. And today we'll be talking with key fintech players. Can you hear me? Today we'll be talking with key fintech players and government regulators on how to create synergy between them. This discussion session will be divided into, into three. We will have, the first session will be on understanding regulatory perspectives. The second will be on emerging digital economy and new cadre of tech service providers. And the third session will be on fostering a business friendly ecosystem. Our moderator for this session will be Ugo Dre Obichuku, who is the CEO of Naira Metrics, and he'll be in charge of taking care of all the sessions. So I'm handing over to Mr. Ugo now. All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction, Janet. Uh, apologies for that mix up. I had slight issues with my system, but I believe I'm back on. I hope everybody can hear me. Can you guys hear me now? Uh, Janet, raise up your hand if you can hear me. I hear you. All right, all right, great, great, great. Uh, thank you all, everybody. Thanks for being uh, on this session. Welcome to Nyometrics FinTech Rising, uh, creating synergy between players, uh, FinTech players and regulators. Uh, over the last few weeks, and if you've been in this country, you would have seen a lot of, uh, what I say, outrage or you know complaints uh, or concerns uh, raised by a lot of players in fintechs, and of course, also raised by uh, regulators. So uh, the question has basically been, who is right? Where is this misunderstanding? Uh, is the misunderstanding from the point of view of regulators, or uh, is innovation? Uh, is it uh, the, you know the fintech players that are misunderstanding the regulators, or is it just a case of you know regulation trying to catch up with innovation uh, as you've typically been across the globe or across across the world innovation is always typically uh, ahead of everything and yes 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 may 1st is labor day so happy labor day to every single person whether you're a worker you're an employee or you're an employer or you're a laborer you know it takes a whole lot um you know to work and earn uh, money so happy labor day to everyone and thank you so much for being on this uh, we have a bumper panel, as you can see right on the screen. So 
I'm going to be doing a quick intro uh, to everyone here, uh, just as we always do. So we try to keep it very simple um, and modest. So first of all, I'd like to introduce uh, Kola Aina, my very good friend, Mr. K. Kola is the founding partner at Ventures Platform, uh, early stage uh, discovery uh, venture capital, championing the next generation of African entrepreneur. I mean, if you guys are in the fintech space, whether in Nigeria or even globally, this is somebody that you should know. If you don't know him, whether follow him or if you're trying to innovate something or create the next big thing, then this is somebody that you should know. So it's going to be interesting to have um, Kola on the panel today. And Kola is definitely going to be sharing a lot of nuggets, uh, useful things, uh, useful information that you know anyone who's interested in the future of fintech in Nigeria uh, should want to know. Thanks, Kola. Welcome to, to this webinar. Thanks for having uh, me. Next up, all right. Great, bro. Great, bro. Next up is no other than Tosi Oshibodu. Tosi is the founder of one of Nigeria's premier uh, fintech platform. Uh, you can use this platform, Shaka, to invest in you know equities, stocks globally, uh, or even in Nigeria. So uh, uh, Tosi uh, formerly worked in technology growth and marketplace at uh, GT Bank into Switch, Wayfair and Apex Nexus. So this is somebody who is experienced in how, uh, you know, even regulators play and how innovation uh, drives um, information across Nigeria. Welcome to Singh, good to have you here again. Right, so next up is, Anna. We, you know, I like to call, you know, I like to call him, um, you know, whiskey, the whiskey of the tech industry. Uh, sharp, sharp young guy, Joshua Chibrezi is the co-founder and chief marketing officer of Piggyvest. Uh, we've had Joshua on a couple of Nyometrics and webinars or Nyometrics shows, uh, whether it's on radio or whether it's on uh, Clubhouse. And he's always been ready to share useful nuggets, always ready, you know, to bridge the divide between uh, regulators, consumers, and fintech players. So Joshua, good to have you on board today. I hope Joshua is online. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. All right, great, Joshua. Next up, huh, on the regulator side, and I'm so glad that um, he was able uh, to make it. I hope he's online. It's OK, OK, uh, is the chief economist at OK Umeana. Umeana. I hope I got, the, I got the spelling right. He's the chief economist at uh, the Security and Exchange Commission, SEC. He's got over 20 years experience in finance, asset, and risk management. He's also a CFE charter holder, uh, financial risk manager, versatile, goal-oriented, and um, he's somebody who at least uh, you would like to hear his views. He's not, uh, you know, ancient as some people, you know, like to make of the Security and Exchange Commission. A lot of people in regulations, particularly in Nigeria, are very, very smart guys. Uh, these are not just ordinary guys. These are very, very smart people. They're also very in tune with what's going on globally. Uh, but, you know, they got to do the job of a regulator. And so today, we're going to try and, you know, bridge this divide and try and ensure that everybody is on the same page. Because at the end of the day, all we're trying to look for is a better Nigeria. And the only way we can bridge the divide between what we have globally and locally is through technology. I think everybody understands that. But at the end of the day, it's all about the consumer. How do we ensure that the consumers out there, you know, even the retail investors out there are well protected? And that's typically the job of the regulator. So it's going to be a bumper panel. Um, okay, are you online? Yeah, th thank you, Audre, for that uh, introduction. And welcome, everybody. Thank you, thank you so much, okay, for being um, uh, on this webinar. As usual, uh, we're going to entertain questions at some point. Uh, so if you've got uh, questions that you want to ask any of our panelists, uh, please just, um, you know, drop it in the chat, in the chat box. Uh, the guys in admin will definitely um, uh, respond to, or will pick some of the questions that we have there, and then uh, we would uh, also take them on this show as it goes on. Uh, this is uh, an interesting um, show. I, I don't know if this this is probably one of the first times um, in in many months that you've had you know somebody from the regulatory side sit on a panel and then someone from the um, people from the tech side also sit on the other panel. I think that at the end of the day, like I said earlier, everybody's looking for a common uh, objective here. Right. So uh, we get. A Uh, Kola, you ready for me? I'm going to go uh, at least get ahead of the game when it comes to 21st century. Uh, so just for those who are probably wondering, 
and I'm listening and like, look, all these fintech guys, like what's their own? Like what, 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 are they the only ones in this world? Or are they the only ones, you know, like doing stuff in this country? Why is innovation like important for us in this financial system? Why should we even be bothered to listen to people in the fintech space? Call up. Thank you, Ugo. Uh, once again, thanks for having me, Ugo. And it's a pleasure to be on this panel with friends and um, some old friends and some new friends. Um, you know, I think, you know, before we go very far, let's not even fool ourselves, right? The, the progress that we see today, or the reason we're having this panel is really because the Nigerian fintech ecosystem has experienced significant growth and progress, and it's, it's now becoming more mainstream. I think that we will be foolish to not give the credit to, to, to where it's deserved. And I, I would like to squarely start this conversation by handing that credit, not only to the innovators, some of who are on this call today and the investors, but more importantly, the regulator, right? Uh, and I'm glad we have SEC on this, on this panel today as well as the CBN, because you know, there are several markets in the world today that uh, can't say the same. We, we, we've, we've been fortunate up to this point to have regulators that have to a very large extent allowed uh, these innovations to thrive. But I certainly think that what got us here as a country or as an ecosystem is certainly not going to take us further, right? Uh, you have a situation where uh, these innovations have become mainstream uh, and, are, and are likely or possible to, to, to impact, you know, systemic risk on, 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 on the macro, on the macro, on the economy as a whole. And so any regulator would be, would be irresponsible not to, not to pay a heightened level of attention to, to what could be a growing, um, a growing sector. That being said, uh, the question you've asked, um, uh, that being said, there are things to, to improve upon. And I think, I hope that we can have some of those conversations today. You asked why innovation? Um, and I guess my, 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 my response to that is, look, when you have in Nigeria today, you've got probably one of the fastest growing populations uh, in the world. Uh, you've got, at the same time, rising unemployment. You've got high rates of poverty and low productivity. Now, all of this combined together creates an environment where the most, the most famous thing you have is really non-consumption, right? That is essentially mm -hmm. the inability of people and businesses to consume what they what they would ordinarily want or need, and so there is no market or country in the world that needs innovation more desperately than Nigeria. And it's not just fintech; I think it's across every sector. The reason fintech innovation is needed more than ever is that fintech innovation in itself is is, is not only an end in itself, but it's also a means to enable other kinds of innovation, right? Because for for, for, for someone to deliver healthcare innovatively over, over, um, over, um, over telemedicine, for instance, they first of all have to be able to capture value. And so what you have is a scenario where FinTech itself is an end in itself, but it's also a pipe. Now, mm. you know, to deepen the conversation, we, we don't just need innovation in Nigeria. We need a specific kind of innovation and I think it is the specificity of that kind of innovation that, that seems to be causing a lot of the friction that we're seeing. Now, if, if, the, if, the, if the fintechs in Nigeria were simply just uh, doing traditional things like you know, acting like banks, there would be no problem because you have existing policies. If, if, the fin, if Chaka, for instance, was basically processing um, uh, stock trades uh, you know, in the traditional way, you know, every time you needed to place an order, you needed to call your broker. There would be no problem. The reality, though, is that because of the chronic non-consumption that I alluded to already, that is to say, mm -hmm. um, without piggy vest, for instance, millions of youthful Nigerians today will have all their small salaries eroded by inflation and, and low interest rates. So because you have those peculiar mm -hmm. challenges, you need a particular kind of innovation. And you know, that kind of innovation is often called a market creating innovation. The challenge is that a market creating innovation suggests that you will create a new market, a new value delivery system. 
And that certainly upsets existing processes. So I think as regulators, as innovators, we must come to terms with the fact that Nigeria, there's no country in the world that needs innovation more than Nigeria today. That's the only way we're going to be able to meet the needs of 200 million plus people, uh, despite a depressed economy. But we must also then come to terms with the kind of innovation that we need and the fact that this kind of innovation needs to be regulated differently, needs to be looked at differently. Mm. I think that is the heart of the conversation. You know, so, 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 so it's, it's not, it's not um, Joshua or Tosin's fault that they have to be troublemakers or it's not like they like to be troublemakers. It's that they're simply responding to the needs of the country. The traditional means of investing or saving just don't work. They don't work for the vast majority of Nigerians, right? Um, uh, I mean, before Piggy Vest, for instance, as a young Nigerian, you had no options to save, right? And so you saw people doing things like all kinds of Ponzi schemes and whatnot, right? But today, using a market creating innovation that is rethinking the value delivery system, you, 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 you have an alternative in Piggy Vest or in Chaka or in Tro or the rest of them. And so I think I just wanted to situate the fact that, to summarize, there is no country in the world that needs innovation more desperately than Nigeria. And, and, and on top of that, we need a particular kind of innovation, which is market creating. And because it's market creating, it suggests that it is new, which means that you would have regulatory friction. And so this is not strange. I'm very comfortable with the chaos personally. And I just like to acknowledge that our regulators are not crazy after all. They're only doing their job. Thanks. All right, great, great. Thanks for those insights, Kola. I mean, I picked a lot of nuggets on what you said. Um, no country or no market in the world needs fintech more than Nigeria. And I kind of agree with you as well. Uh, you also said that, you know, we need a specific kind of, you know, um, innovation in Nigeria. And I mean, you kind of alluded to capital formation, innovation that can actually engender capital formation. And that's something that we've, we've kind of struggled with in Nigeria a lot of times. Uh, I mean, I've been investing in this country for almost two decades. And you kind of find out that every single type of investment outlet in Nigeria is dominated by foreign portfolio investors who typically make making hot money when things are good and when things are bad, uh, they take away hot money. Uh, the only thing I was a little bit concerned about was that, I mean, have we not seen you know, technology in the investment space before? So I'm going to come to you, uh, Tosin. I mean, you've been, you've been in the investment space for a while and you're kind of experienced too. Um, certainly, right, there has been, you know, different kind of maybe, you know, at least I've seen some mobile apps for investing in Nigerian stocks, probably not as good as, as Shaka and, and the rest of them. Uh, you know, we've seen that, you know, gone are the days when you have to basically use paper, you know, fill a form or call your broker to, you know, to get you uh, a stock. You can actually do these things online. But, you know, Shaka has come and basically disrupted the entire space. So what exactly, you know, um, has Shaka done you know, that has basically disrupted things. And, you know, what kind of, you know, what, what potential does your platform have to, you know, do more, to basically bring, uh, you know, Nigeria's, you know, ecosystem of investments into one place. And like, you know, I, I guess to, to call us point, a lot of young people want to be able to go into a mobile app, which they are used to, right? Mobile phones do, you know, move money from their bank account to an investment account and then invest in, anything that they want to invest in and then also see you know their return on investment right there and then like feel cool about it so what exactly does shaka bring on board that we haven't seen before yeah thanks for so, thanks for thanks for the question Rizzo. yeah so you know I, I i have a you know a little bit of a different take take here because you know when it comes to all the investment apps and whatnot i think it's still money and when money is entering any mm. asset and it's entering it at scale, then ultimately, I think regulated, regulators are going to be invest, um, invested. Um, but as it comes to what we do for the market, um, we, we enable uh, digital investing so that it's, we lower the barriers, make it easier for first time investors to get into the market, get the trust they need, um, um, get the knowledge they need um, to start the investment journey. Uh, we also, Make it easier for foreign um, portfolio investors to be, oh, sorry, foreign uh, investors and people based outside Nigeria, really the diaspora, to be able to also invest 
really easily into the market without as many intermediaries. Um, overall, just lowering the barriers to digital investing is why we exist. So um, that, that was the reason we came into the market. We see apps as a way to do it. We see partnerships as a way to do it. We see working with regulators based on their um, uh, mandates as a way to do it. Um, so for us, you know, we, we see that the need that people have to grow their income, to save, to be able to plan long-term for the future will be met by a number of different investment means. It happens generationally, of course, that you know, investment apps is gonna be great for this generation. But I don't think it means that there is an innovation happening elsewhere in that whole chain for, for different segments who prefer different ways of investing. You know, there can be innovation in the financial product and the means of delivering that financial product and the accessibility. So there's so much room for more innovation. Um, I think Carla talked about non-consumption and I'll call it like non-investment in this case, which is how many people who want to invest in general and grow their money um, are, are, um, are hampered by the fact that they're not sure who to trust and they don't have the knowledge, mm. right? I think the regulator plays a really big role in that, um, but so do players. Um, and, you know, I'll just say that when you look at the whole investment space, uh, really long term, right? Really long term. It's really important that the, um, yeah, it's really important that the Nigerian capital market gets more and more digital because then that lowers the access, the cost of access for everyone, both retail and corporate. It makes it easier to develop new financial products. It makes the markets operate more efficiently. And vice versa, it also enables easier um, foreign investment into the markets, which is in line with regulators' goals. So we are really particular about the possibilities that um, are created where digital investing happens across the whole chain. Sure, on the front end, but even on the back end, you know, we, we do have interesting initiatives uh, being explored with, with NSE, with CSCS and Co. So we're really particular about the, what digital investing can do to enable the markets, both in terms of integrating with the world and in terms of also making it easier for people to get started and invest in. Um, so th that, that's how that's how we see it. But apps are are a particular instance of that. So that's 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 also true. All right, thanks, Tosin. I mean, good you, good you acknowledge the role that uh, regulators play in basically trying to at least give a lot of credibility to some of the apps you know you have out there. I mean, it doesn't take much really these days to build an app and just have it in the app store and then open it up to people to start to you know you know contribute money or start to put money in it. So, uh, but at the end of the day, you know, that's why you, you got to have a middle player, someone in the middle ground trying to balance things up. But I guess, you know, to your point, uh, it's important to have innovation out there, but you also need to have regulators, you know, by the side. So it's basically how well these things synergize and, and work together. And, and it's true, it's all about the money at the end of the day. So, uh, yeah, you know, you know as long as you keep cycles, right? It works in cycles. On the up, everybody wants freedom, but then on the down, that's where you see the regulator protection. So it's the balance. Exactly. Is there. No one's going to be happy on one side. Uh, you know, the funny thing is that once you lose your money, then everybody's like, where the hell are the regulators? Like, where have they been? You know what I mean? Exactly. All right. So I'm going to come to, to, to Joshua now. Um, Joshua, I think that, you know, I heard Kola, you know, talk about Piggy Vest and how it's basically trying to give people sort of democratize investments and give people access to, you know, different forms of investment that they probably never did have. Uh, and, and, you know, Tosin also kind of alluded to that too. Um, so data suggests that there are about 6% of Nigerian adults uh, who are on the bank. Uh, when we say adults, of course, you're looking at people who can, you know, have a bank account from about maybe 17 years and above um, on the bank. And that's a whole lot of people. Uh, and I really don't know whether, are these the same guys that have smartphones or are just, are this just, you know, um, everyone, you know, in, in its entirety. So. For your for, for piggy vest, um, I mean, it, a lot of people who I've read a lot of stuff about, about piggy vest, especially in Nigeria. It kind of looks like we haven't even taken off yet. Like piggy vest is just at the cost of actually doing what they're here for. They're just even starting, and there's just so much, you know, uh, uh, um, noise already about you know what they're doing. Um, what exactly um, are you trying to solve? Are you trying to give people access to? various investment platforms or are you trying to give people access to maybe or an opportunity to attain some kind of financial freedom or is this just about making money for yourselves maybe just oh just you know i get the commission of it I and mean, what exactly are you trying to solve joshua okay um 
when you talk about um, people who are on the banks, I mean, these are people who uh, do not have access to, I mean, mainstream financial services or products. Um, but thinking back to how we started or why we started Piggy Vest, I would say we, we, we started it basically to kind of like solve our own personal problems. So the goal eventually is financial freedom. And um, um, when you look at all of the products we, we have um, launched over the, over the past five years, everything is geared towards financial freedom. We find out that today, not a lot of people have even access to these opportunities. A lot of people earn a salary today. They don't know what to invest in. They don't know the right products to invest in. Some of the, a lot of people have gotten scammed over the years. People just, you know, hear surface stuff and then go ahead and do it. What we've tried to do is create a safe space for a lot of people to actually invest and trust that whatever it is they're investing in, uh, their funds will always get back to them. So mm -hmm. it's always been that for us, right? Um, there are a lot of people. So for instance, our Investify product. Right. And the spare product is, is, is very simple. It is a lot of people don't have, say, up to 500K, a million, two million, whatever it is to invest. You know, a lot of people think, OK, they even have to wait till they have a box on to invest. But what we've done with one of our products, Investify, is to say, OK, you don't have to wait till you have that. As with as little as 5,000, we will give you access to the same interest rates the person who is investing one million will get. So again, it's just democratizing access to opportunities, providing the opportunities, and then making it easy for the everyday man to benefit from it. So again, the goal is financial freedom and everything we're doing is to ensure that people are able to live better, right? Um, mm. There's before, I mean, before Piggy Vest, um, what you have is your bank is giving you an ATM card and on your savings account. Right, that is that doesn't really work for a lot of people who are trying to save. So, what we've done is created a place where it's easy for you to, you know, focus on your life, do what you need to do, but you also have something kept, and it's also very very safe. So, I'll say the goal for us has always been financial freedom, and that's pretty much what we want to. All right, um, Joshua, you know, still sticking on you on on this theme as well. Um, yes, the goal is financial freedom. I think it's important that you clear that. But could there also be, you know, a goal around trying to also drive culture, like, you know, instill some kind of cultural, you know, way of dealing with money? I mean, I like that you said, even if you have 5K, you know, you can also get the same kind of interest that somebody has 1 million, I guess, even though the return, in, you know, if you quantify it, maritimes might be different. But at least you're basically encouraging a habit. Is this part of what you guys are trying to do as well, apart from maybe attaining financial freedom? Yes. Yeah, so um, if you notice, what, what Piggy Vest has been able to do is create a new behavior to money. You mm -hmm. find that mm -hmm. once young people um, have some money, all they think about, or people who use Piggy Vest, all they think about immediately is just putting some into their Piggy Vest. So what that does is that's created a new normal for people who didn't have access to this type of things before. So obviously new behavior um, is being formed across board when it comes to savings, investments. There's a lot of financial literacy going on. People are talking to people, oh, what are you doing with your money? What's going on? Oh, I use this, I use this platform, I use this platform. And everyone is playing um, you know, in their own space. You know, I loved what um, Kola said in the beginning. There is need for um, there's need there's need for you know everyone to come together to do things that will help you know the country as it is that we find that um, Nigeria as a whole is kind of like sinking right there is a lot of issues going on uh, people are getting poorer you know there's there are no opportunities so it, what, what we've tried to do is basically create a new normal to help people kind of like benefit from what they are supposed to be getting All right, um, you know, thanks for those, thanks for sharing those insights, Joshua. Remember, uh, participants, if you want to ask any question, go to the Q and A section and then drop your questions there. We might not be able to pick questions from the chat chat box, but of course, if you've got intelligent, um, you know, contributions to make or anything, any contribution at all, uh, you can have that on the chat uh, section. I've seen some interesting 
uh, comments being made already on the chat side. Uh, but if you've got questions, please drop it there. Uh, I'm going to come to you next, okay? Um, I mean, it was, I think it was just, uh, it made sense that we had you coming last so that at least you can hear uh, a lot of the other people. Uh, you know, I think that over the last few few weeks, we've seen the regulators come under some kind of flack on particularly on social media by young people. Um, you know, perhaps maybe there's some kind of misunderstanding around, you know, the role of the regulator and the role of the fintech. Uh, and then, you know, people kind of sound like maybe this is, uh, maybe the regulator once again, trying to like be, uh, you know, a snag to, to innovation. Maybe, could you just maybe use this opportunity to, you know, properly explain to, you know, even some of the, you know, the, the, the panelists will have young participants. What exactly is the role of the regulator in trying to democratize investment, which basically has been the theme here so far? Okay. Thank you, Godre. Um, and uh, thank you all the panelists for actually doing part of my job. Um, I think Kola started <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and uh, oh, the Tosin and um, Joshua continued. Joshua. Yeah. Yeah, um, you see, the regulator has no interest in uh, stifling um, innovation. We need to get that clear. The regulator wants, um, uh, for us, I'll, I'll speak for the SEC, um, wants a deeper market, a more efficient market. Uh, one of the um, objectives we have for the next um, year is to try to get uh, younger Nigerians into the market. Our studies show that uh, the demographic in the in our traditional markets is quite old, and uh, we are actually happy that um, uh, these uh, fintechs are offering options, you know, for that that interests the younger demographic, and uh, it's in line with what we want to do, and that's why. Uh, we are supporting them, but then uh, the activities have to be um, according to the rules and regulations, according to the law. You know, as uh, someone mentioned, one, one of the uh, speakers before me mentioned, nobody calls the regulator when things are up, when things are going north. It's when they are going south, the regulator is called in. So uh, the regulator wants these things to happen, but within the ambit of the law, within the, 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 you know, the, the guidelines. And that's what the regulators are saying. You know, I, I keep, um, I, this is, I think, the fourth or fifth webinar I have attended on this uh, issue representing the SEC. And, and there's one uh, theme I, I keep uh, letting uh, everyone know. The regulator looks at the greater good. While we want innovation, while we want efficiency, while we want new things to happen, we also have to balance it with protecting the investor, especially the one who doesn't really um, have the wherewithal to protect himself. Okay, so if you look at some of the rules we have made, we exempt the high net worth individuals and institutions from some of the, you know, uh, of the restrictions we put. Okay, so we need to uh, protect investors. The SEC has a three-pronged mandate, regulate the market, develop the market, protect the investor. So if uh, someone comes up with a FinTech, um, uh, uh, with an innovation and just goes up, sets up job, starts to do it, I saw one of the questions because when uh, Joshua was speaking, I, I quickly took a peek at the, at the chat. And someone was asking, why does the regulator wait until these things have started? It's the, it's the very, the, the reason the regulator waits is that the regulator is not interested in shutting these things down. The regulator is not in, interested in stopping inno, innovation. The regulator opens his doors and expects or invites the person to come. I can tell you how we have done this for these fintechs. Presently, we have a fintech and innovation office. If you go to our website, you see that they even have a portal with uh, details on how to reach them and all that. What is our office mandated to do? Listen to people, find how you can help them get regulated, how you can help them do what they want to do within the regulations. 
Okay, I understand the, the often said, um, often said uh, point, often uh, stated point that uh, the regulator sometimes tries to tries to fit um, innovation into the old, you know, like pouring new wine into the old skin. Yeah, and, and we have heard that from the market, and that's why we have started, um, you know, making categories of. Um, of, uh, of, of rules, you know, that sort of make it easier to accommodate these um, these, uh, these uh, fintechs. So what the regulator wants is come in, discuss, tell us what you want to do. Let's find how you can do it within the guidelines. And that's what we've been saying. We wouldn't have done that if we if uh, wouldn't have uh, opened a fintech office, a fintech and innovation office, if we were interested in stifling innovation or closing entities. Okay, so that's what is happening. So um, I, I, want the, I want the market, I want the industry to see the SEC for one, and all the regulators as enablers. We're enablers who also have the responsibility to protect investors. So while you're looking at, okay, I'm going to innovate, I'm going to do this, we're going to be asking you, what about the risk management issues? How do you settle the disputes? How do you protect uh, the assets? Who owns the asset? You know, we're going to be asking you those questions that entrepreneurs hardly ask. Hmm. So that's our role. And that's the role we intend to play. So I want to just let everybody know first, as uh, you know, as a, as a threshold for this discussion, that we are not interested in stifling innovation. In fact, we want the innovation. And uh, companies like this even help us achieve our mandate or achieve our objective, which is to bring a new demographic into the market. I'll leave it at that for now. Right, okay. Okay, okay. Still, still on you. I mean, interesting, interesting insights that you just broke down here. Um, but I mean, I hear you, and I think that it's pretty clear, especially some of us who um, have been in this, you know, um, in this space for a while, whether as, as investors or as stakeholders. Uh, but you know, you know how fluid innovation can be. Um, you know how what it is when you just have a brainwave and you're with some friends and you try to put something together and then you move in, you know, into yeah. the market. So a lot of these people are very young people, probably in their early 20s or even late teens, and you know, just trying to create something great. And of course, probably have bootstrapping or using parents' money or using money of friends, you know, to move in and it quickly catches on. We have social media now, so it's pretty easy for people to trust a lot of these people, uh, a lot of these guys. So, I mean, yes, there are rules around, you know, how you, you know, push capital formation or move money from people, whether, you know, via social media or anywhere else. I hear you say, you know, you have a portal on your website, you know, these guys should come to you. But what about the regulators going to some of these guys? I mean, it's pretty easy, I think, to, to see a lot of them, the ones that are probably high up there. Is there any kind of platform, you know, or, you know, where the regulators can rely on to at least, perhaps maybe even educate a lot of these guys about some of their guidelines? And to be honest, I don't know how many people are going to go into set guidelines and read everything. Uh, perhaps lawyers can do that. But these guys, at least they probably don't have lawyers. All the money they have, they're pushing it into their, 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 their ideas and their innovation. So, how has the regulator been able to bridge that divide? Like, have you maybe like lent out an, an only branch out there and say, look, guys, I see what you guys are doing. Come on, tell me about it. How can we help you? Has that happened? Okay. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, yes, that has happened. Uh, we have made um, many efforts at that and we keep making more efforts. The, the efforts may not be enough, but uh, I, I can tell you we're making efforts. I, I, one of them is that um, we set up a FinTech Roadmap Committee made up of uh, people, mostly people by, by people in the FinTech industry in Nigeria. Uh, and they did extensive work and uh, told us what was happening and uh, what the stakeholders expected from us. And we began to implement that roadmap. One of the things the roadmap said was engagement. But you know, for us, um, we would like to engage, but sometimes we find it difficult to know who to engage with. And that's why we've been encouraging the fintech um, companies to set up associations and groups, because it's easier for us to say, okay, we are, can we invite um, an association of uh, XYZ to speak to them, rather than uh, you know, you know, trying to target individual companies. So if they set up groups and associations, it makes it easier for us. Not that we cannot um, you know, speak with companies and all that. Um, 
For the past uh, 18 months or so, we've been engaging fintechs with one-on-one -on -one meetings. Right now, we have uh, many of them, I mean, uh, scores of them who are going through the regulatory uh, approval process. And some of them, we, we, we just called them or emailed them, or some of them just uh, filled our FinTech assessment form. We have a FinTech assessment form on the website. And that way we were able to get their numbers and their emails and call them in. And they came in and we started discussing. Some of them are, are the, at the tail end of the, the, the very end of the, of, the, of the regulatory approval process. So we try to do that. We also try to attend webinars and the engagements like what we are having now, like I just told you, um, this is like the fifth I'm going to on this issue since um, the directive by the CBN and the SEC came from the cryptocurrency one. And also, I've been on channels, I've been on uh, uh, um, uh, Arise, and you know, we go around trying to let people know that we are ready to work with this fintech. So that's what we are doing. But, but I'm, we're happy to, to uh, you know, to listen. If there's a better way to go about this, I, I'm all ears. I have my, my daughter here, and I can assure you that if I get any idea on how a better way to engage these um, companies, I'll take it back to the SEC. All right, thank, thanks so much. Um, okay, um, we just about end the, the first part of this session, which we titled Understanding Regulatory Perspectives. Uh, but Kola, I'm just gonna give you an opportunity to, to perhaps respond uh, on behalf of, of the FinTech community. Um, I don't know if you call out, um, if you could respond. I mean, you heard okay. They are willing to, you know, even play the initiative of coming up front. And and, and okay, I said like, look, they've done that a few times. So where where has there been some kind of miscommunication? Uh, uh, you know, call out. I also do know that there are fintech associations out there. You know, different types of fintech associations, and they've often tried to reach out. You know, to to the regulator. So where where perhaps are we are we missing something here? Uh, Kola, and anybody else who, who wishes to chime in as well can chime in. Uh, Kola, are you there? Yes, thank you, um, Ugo. And um, okay, thank you so much for those remarks. Um, I listened very attentively. I, I think I think the SEC has clearly, again, not to over, overstate this. The SEC has clearly distinguished itself in being in being collaborative. I mean, we saw that with what happened. Um, with the with, with the um, crowdfunding regulations that were put out last year, there was there was extensive engagement mm. throughout that process. So so clearly we can only ask for more. But I think that I think I, I would like to pick on a few things that Okay said. Okay, you know you kept mentioning the ambit of the law, the ambit of the law, and the reality is that uh, law doesn't feed people. Law doesn't uh, laws don't create employment. You know you can't mandate jobs. You can't mandate prosperity. So the challenge is this philosophy that innovation must fit within the law. It's, it's the opposite. I think there's a, the, in, in the stack of priority, protecting investors and I think enabling the market, I think there are about three key responsibilities uh, that the SEC holds that you mentioned. I think, I think where we are today in Nigeria, the prioritization needs to move to enabling innovation. Like literally, literally, you know, Causing innovation to happen because that's the only way we are going to lift all these millions of people that we're creating out of poverty, right? And so, and so I think I think it's a function of outlook. Now, you know, I think we're going to discuss this later, but we we are not faulting, you know, the fact that you are regulating, but I think you have to think about regulation differently. So one of the things I object to, for instance, is sudden circulars don't help anybody. Like just putting out a circular on Friday evening or even Monday morning, it doesn't help anybody because you see, we are we are today we're, we're living in a world of instant information flow, right? And these circulars mm. create shocks in the system. The information travels really fast. I mean, this the, the last circular, for instance, went out at the time when some of these companies were fundraising, right? And mm. immediately investors freeze. What's going on? And the market needs this fundraising. And so, so since, you know, in cases where the operators are known, as opposed to a circular, you know, that creates panic in the market, an invitation can happen. Invite the operators in, explain what you're trying to achieve. They are known people. They are not, they are not even Ugo can gather all of them for you. Ugo knows them. <laughs> 
<laughs> Write to all the operators, tell them, look, these are the concerns we have. This is what we'd like to do. They would listen. But you know, you know, there's just the frequency of, of, of circulars and regulatory pronouncements. I'll tell you something as an investor. So I'm not a fintech operator and I'm, I'm, and I'm, not, I'm not in front of you for a line sense at least today. But I'm well invested in, or we're well invested in several companies that are. Piggy Vest is one of our portfolio companies. Trove is one. Those companies today are, are creating high value jobs in our market, besides the fact that they are solving problems for millions of people. And every time a circular goes out or a memo goes out or there's an, a, a random announcement, it creates panic on the investor side and on the customer side for these companies. And so I think it's not about saying stop regulating, it's about, suggest, it's, it's about suggesting a different approach to say, look, can we be, can, can we focus more on dialogue? Can we, can we consider the impact of these announcements on the going concern status of these companies, both from an investment raising standpoint and, for, and, for, and from, a conf, from the standpoint of confidence of, of their users? You know, um, I'll, I'll pause there for now. Um, you know, uh, yeah. All right, thanks, Kola. I think I'm going to give OK a chance to perhaps respond uh, here. I think it's only fair that, that he does respond. Um, and I, uh, even if I hear Kola clearly, his concern, OK, is that, look, you know, nothing wrong with, with going about with your regulatory job. Uh, but I mean, how do we also try to, you know, soften a lot of all these, um, you know, announcements that sometimes just happen out of the blues? Uh, I mean, it's always important if, you know, players in the industry at least have a sense of what's going on or what's about to happen. And I think, you know, we see things like that in the banking sector as well, where some banks already know that there's going to be some kind of circular out and then they start to prepare themselves. So is there any way the regulators can perhaps maybe, you know, do this better uh, in the future? Okay. Oh, okay. Um, thank you, Kola, for pointing that out. Um, I think it's one of the things I will take back uh, about the shocks that, you um, regulatory pronouncements uh, bring. But I also think that um, uh, the other side, that's uh, the, the innovators, entrepreneurs who, who run these uh, companies can also do well to make inquiries, you know. Uh, like I said before, we are open to these inquiries. I think that if you ask before you, you, you make those steps, it, it might make it easier uh, for us to, uh, you know, agree before uh, these things uh, happen. Uh, uh, like I was saying before, one of the reasons we are we seem to be slow to act is that we want um, these companies to survive. So if we didn't want them to survive, we, we, we can close them immediately, they, they, we, we see them. But we want them to survive, we want them to succeed. But we expect that uh, the promoters would also um, do their part, you know? Um, if you're in a regulated business, you're in capital market business, it's your responsibility to find out what you ought to do, you know, to, to ensure that, um, uh, yeah, you, you go to the regulator, let me put it that way. You go to the regulator, find out what you ought to do. I think that one of the things that, uh, one of the problems we have is that the innovators or the owners or the promoters of these companies think that the regulator does not want them to, you know, do these things. That's I, I, that's why I, I've I've been ha hammering on this. I, I need that to go. If you see the regulator as someone you can approach and say, I want to do A, B, C, and the regulator says, Can you do it this way? You say no, I, and you negotiate. You you not negotiate. You discuss and arrive at something. It's better. It's better. That's what I'm saying. So I will take back um, a collab. Uh, perfect, um, excellent um, uh, 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 view you've given me. I'll take that back uh, as part of the shocks that uh, regulatory pronouncements have. But I also want the industry to do what's right. Come to the SEC and ask how you can do these things correctly. So I think that the two of us have that just- All right, thanks, okay. Fantastic, and I'm sure Kola is probably gonna, um, you know, maybe maybe say something on that. But Kola, I'm gonna come to you next, though. so you have an opportunity to to at least respond to um, the olive branch, uh, just you know, um, you know, push forward or or stretch, uh, you know, from okay there. Uh, what before before you respond as well, uh, let me use this opportunity uh, to also tell our our, our our participants here that you can ask questions in the Q and A box. 
um, the guys at Naira Metrics and the admin uh, would pick some questions and then send them to me and then I can ask as well. Uh, please feel free to also comment on the chat box. And please tell your friends to come on. This is a very, very important webinar that we're having here, especially for uh, for those in the fintech community. It's very important that we sort of like, you know, get uh, you know the regulators and fintech players together. And this is going to be the first of many. I think we're probably going to have something as well with other regulators, be it the CBN or the CCPC. It's important to also understand these guys. Like I said earlier, these are not just, you know, some guys stuck in the past. They are also very intelligent people. Um, who are doing their job. So Kola, uh, just before you respond as well, take this question because we can respond to all at the same time. Um, you know, there's been a lot of innovation as well from re regulatory wise, from the point of view of, of maybe people like the CBN. We've recently seen, and I think you did mention to it, the crowdfunding regulation that, you know, SEC put out. I didn't see a lot of noise around that from the FinTech community, by the way. Perhaps maybe uh, a lot of them are still digesting this. Uh, but the CBN as well, I, and I dare say, our CBN is probably one of the most innovative athletes in Africa when it comes to, you know, the fintech space. There's so many things, uh, you know, so many regulations and so many guidelines that they've pushed out. Uh, so what are players in, in, in this industry, in the fintech space, doing to take opportunity, uh, you know, to partake in the already, already existing regulatory sandbox that we've seen uh, from the CBN? So, um, Kola, please, of course, respond to, to OK, and then uh, you can take on that question. Kola. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, and thanks for you know uh, acknowledging the and you know and and taking it back. Um, I want to add another one to that, if you permit me. Um, if you expect <laughs> if you expect an innovator to come and ask you for permission uh, when they decide on their innovation, you you'll be waiting for a long time. I'm just telling you the truth. It's not the way innovation works. It's just not how it works. Mm. The way innovation works is rapid implement experimentation. You're trying to figure it out until it works. You're not. No one is going to go meet the regulator to say, "Okay, I want to do it this way." Can I? Can I? Do, is that? Can you? It's not going to work. So we have to again. I keep taking us back to the beginning of the conversation. We either want innovation or we don't want it. If we realize how important it is to us, you talked about the green demographic of the Nigerian capital market. That's a huge challenge, right? If we truly see these innovations as contributing to that progress, then we need, to, we need to allow it first. And I think the way you went about the innovation in the, in the, in the crowdfunding space is actually a good example. None of those guys came to the SEC to ask for permission in the beginning, right? And you know, at, at the time that you know, your guidelines went out, all the operators in that space were begging, at least the good operators were desperate for regulation. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying because you now had a, a large amount of copycats that were acting, offering ridiculous returns that I was springing up on a daily basis. I, I really believe that that's a great case study for how uh, regulation should work in this market. Like you literally have to allow folks experiments as the as the. But, as but Kola, 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 can I take you in on this a bit? Can I take you in on this, Kola, if you don't mind? Uh, okay, Tosin, you want to chip in as well? You will chip in at some point. But Kola, let me take you on what you said now. Uh, take you in on it. So I I hear you. Um, you know, innovators can't always go to regulators when they want to innovate. I mean, these things come rapidly, and I, I agree with you hundred percent. But should that be the case, you know, it, does that give everyone, is that like an excuse not to engage regulators? I mean, I, I can give you an example. It's just like you decide now that you want to build an estate, right? And then you just see a piece of land uh, that you probably own, right? And then you decide to build a factory there, right? So don't you have a responsibility to find out, you know, either via the land laws or, you know, that you show that, to, that that site is not about, I mean, where does that happen? What responsibility does an innovator have to also educate the, the regulator? In an estate, uh, it's not an innovation is the point. And remember, I was qualifying my statement, right, that yeah. this is particularly at the end stage of development of these innovations. As okay. these innovations mature and they become regulated entities, e.g., I mean, a company like Paga, for instance, and I know we're not talking about Paga here. Paga is engaging regulators actively. If Paga is going to try something that is currently not covered by the regulation, they probably would go engage with the CBN to say, look, mm -hmm. we'd like to do this. And, 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 and there might even be a joint process to come up with uh, the regulation for that, um, for that, uh, for, for, for that new innovation. Uh, the, look, we can't recreate the innovation process for Nigeria. 
or because we're Nigerians. It's the way it works everywhere. And there's a reason why the US has hundreds of unicorns. There's a reason why uh, uh, Israel has them. And if we want to build an ecosystem like those countries, then we have to look at what they're doing right and localize it for our market. So for the record, I just want to round up by saying, I am not saying that it should be a free for all and companies should do as they like. I'm saying that we must provide some allowance for early stage experimentation. As companies mature, the regulator would, ident would start to identify, you know, sort of the, resp the responsible actors. And I think we can take a more collaborative approach to now regulating. Um, I I'll leave that there for now. Um, you asked the question, and I think, you know, the second question you asked on sandboxes actually speaks to that. Sandboxes are a great way to actually allow that uh, early innovation, but sandboxes are very difficult to implement successfully. There are not too many successful examples. I'm aware of the CBN sandbox. Um, to be honest, I can't point to too many people that use it today or that, uh, you know, and even this morning, just before this uh, panel, I, I asked the question in a couple chat groups, industry chat groups, and I couldn't find anyone that uses it. So I think the CBN mm -hmm. sandbox is a great innovation. Uh, I'm curious if you know anyone that's using it. I think what we need to figure out now is how we make it more mainstream uh, because it would help. Um, but there are other sandboxes. I'm aware of the FSI sandbox that is quite active, uh, sort of a collaborative sandbox between the private sector and the CBN. <laughs> Uh, and it will be really good to learn if to learn more about what the SEC is planning in terms of sandboxes. Thank you. All right, I'm sure Kay is going to speak to that at some point. Um, but let me come to you, Tosi. I'm sure you probably also want to weigh in on the on the, on the earlier discussion. Um, yeah, to be fair, Okay did mention at some point that they do allow um, you know fintech operators basically you know you know innovate at some point. It's just you know, when they get to some stage that, you know, they now come in. Um, I, I think I kind of agree with Kola, um, especially when it comes to technological technology and, and innovating, uh, it can be very rapid. Uh, but where is the maturity stage here? At what point do you say, oh, look, you know what? You, you do need to go and meet the regulator if they haven't come to you, right? Because I mean, like they say, ignorance of the law is not a skill. So um, that that the regulator hasn't come to you yet doesn't mean you should go to doesn't mean that you should know that there is an obligation at some point to get to the regulator. So where where does that happen? At what stage? Uh, is it when you started you know getting people's money, or is it when you started building out the app, or is it when you started attracting investment inflow? At what stage do your in, do you at least as a founder or innovator say you know what I gotta go knock on the doors of of, of, of regulator? So see. Yeah, no, I think this is a, this is a great, this is a great question. Um, and for, for me, from the start, we were very focused on being regulator friendly. Um, I think the thing with technology, if you look at the history of technology, you know, it's it's obviously it started from places where information was like uh, really easy to let's just say innovate on, where there are no consequences, where it's maybe just business processes, you know, with Microsoft right at the start. But where we've gone now is that it's impacting industries that structure certain ways. So I don't think anybody will just say go go and innovate with healthcare or aviation um, because of the downside potential. And obviously, with money, it can be it can be um, what's it called deceptive in that it can look like it's just another thing. But I think it has that downside potential too. So I don't think there's a one way fits all. And if you look at different countries, you see some countries that set up sandboxes and allow innovation to flourish. You see some other countries that have a bit of a free for all and then they choose when to act. So I, I, I think it's a dynamic field, but because of the downside risk potential, then the question is how do you get innovation and protection? And um, I, I think the trade-off is, is, is potentially a false dichotomy. And the closer the startups mm -hmm. are to, to the regulator, the better that, that, uh, that the more likely that synergy is gonna work. So for us, I can speak to say that like, for example, we 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 structured a SIF. A regulator would say, like tomorrow, look. At, I want to look through with the same practices that the regulators have laid out, um, and we're very early in engaging uh, regulators. Now, in terms of action, you know, everybody can have their preference, no doubt. But like, I think over the long span, um, like uh, Mr. Mr. K mentioned, like regulator has to view things from 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 a very high level perspective. So we view ourselves as. How do we make it easy to look like you're trying to comply um, while still trying to innovate? 
because then that shortens the gap of misunderstanding. When you start discussing, you're speaking the same language. You know, I personally, you know, became a member of the Chartered Institute of Stockbrokers. To be in a room with, with other stockbrokers and then they'll know that you didn't just wake up one day and innovate your way here. You understand the rules, the basics of what they're about. Um, you know, my co-founder is a CFA, a certified professional for the same reasons. So we still look at innovation as very important, but we know there's a wisdom of the markets. And again, cycles that happen up and down over time, um, you know, have led to some of these, these, these regulations. Um, I think from the way I see it is that you have to engage proactively and it's always going to be a risk mm -hmm. if you're operating without that engagement and you have to accept that if you're shut down, even if your intentions were good, that that was part of the, of, of, of the mandate that was possible. Um, I think it's incumbent on the innovators to, to, uh, to reach out to regulators, but I also think, of course, who wouldn't like uh, more, more, more uh, proactive, proactive uh, policies from regulators. I don't think anybody will fight that. Um, but for me, I see it um, similar to other industries where people are concerned about downside, and that is a real, real thing. Like there's just going to be a bit more conservative than uh, than, than 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 letting a thousand uh, uh, flowers bloom. Um, but you know, I also think another thing that's important: just stay within the law and make sure that the commitment that you're making. Is within the law and that's where the, the law provides the constraints and innovation kind of like uses that to take it to the limits and enable new things um so um i guess just looking at it from the whole perspective i think if you show personal commitment you stay within the law you, you get regulators then it doesn't probably limit you that much in terms of your innovation potential you just have to have the sentiment mm -hmm. that it's not going to limit you like that when you go into that room you're you're, you're talking to regulators intent on, on, on showing them why why what you're doing is beneficial to their goals um, and vice versa. When you're in the market, you're structuring as if you were regulated and you know what regulators look for so that you're already proactively ahead of that. And I think, um, you know, um, I'm sure Colin and Joshua, you know, the experience is probably mirror that, you know, people aren't irresponsibly doing FinTech just like wait, they, they do do those studies and, 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 and do make sure that they're structured that way. So it's perhaps just closing some of the gaps that may lead to misunderstandings, but just as an operator, I'm never going to say it's the regulator's job for me. Like, you know, I, it's always going to be my responsibility to, to make sure that uh, things are structured right and uh, in line with. All right. To, to, thanks, Tosin. But still sticking with you, though, I, I mean, I, I think that if I'm not mistaken, Shaka is one of the very first, um, um, you know, fintech apps there that you can use to basically invest in, you know, US equities or you know, equities outside Nigeria. Uh, so, so from a regulatory standpoint, uh, are there any assurances that you know maybe speaking to 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 on behalf of the, the industry in general or your, your own space in general are there any assurances that you need to you do need to give regulators for example uh we did see in that um, um press release that they were concerned that you can't basically invest uh in you know equities that are not listed and Nigerian stock is here uh, maybe for, for, for their own reasons or for obvious reasons. So what kind of assurances are you given to, you know, regulators that look, uh, you know, I've, I've seen a few things on the social media saying, look, you gotta also empower Nigerians. You gotta give Nigerians opportunity to sort of diversify, you know, their, their earnings or at least hedge against exchange rate and, and all that stuff. So SEC probably has its own reasons, but what kind of assurances are you given or do you think we should be given to the regulators? To allow you know Nigeria, especially me, you know, have some kind of investment or portfolio outside of this country, uh, Tosin. So yeah, I, you know, I you know I would love to be in a position to speak for the whole industry or even on behalf of regulators. You know, I can't. Um, what I what, what I what I can say is that um, you know I think it's very clear that regulators' intention is to make sure everyone participating is registered and that they're able to understand how a business how businesses are structured and they're in line with how SEC would would uh, would regulate these businesses so you know i can't speak to to, to say that um um you know we should there's, there's a particular there's a particular legal um uh, um whatnot and you know that's i would say that's that's squarely um not, not my domain but i can say that it's very clear that the intention is to is to be registered um and you know it's it's incumbent i think on, on players to engage sec to 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 do that. So um, for me, it's as simple as that is engage regulators show why what we're doing benefits for the country, enabling digital investing, making sure it's easier for people to get into the markets. We're very long term on the Nigerian markets and very long term on developing Nigerian markets and making it 
fuse and be closer to, to, to the world, to the to, to global markets um, as well. Um, so we're very big believers in that vision and that's what drives us. Um, I can't quite speak specifically to, to anything beyond that. Um, I think um, you know, that's probably a question for lawyers or, or regulators themselves. All right, all um, right. Based on, on just thinking about it and the space, it's, it's, I think it's still the same simple principles of align with the regulator and engage with regulators. And then um, things, things are, are, are less likely to be unclear. All right, I'm going to come to you next, Joshua. Um, you know, Piggy Vest is has basically been an enabler in the savings and investment space. Um, um, if there's one thing, I mean, I've spoken to a lot of young people, whether my nieces or nephews or or even much younger uh, cousins, and, and I ask them things like, like, what do you, how do you invest? Where do you invest? Like, oh, they use apps like you know, like Piggy Vest and stuff. But was there when you guys started out? Um, was there any point in time, or maybe maybe let, let me just switch that up a bit. At what point in time did you say to yourself that look, uh, we gotta get you know regulatory back in here, uh, you know? And so, did it happen um, at the you know very early stage, or did it happen at the point where you know you basically started expanding and started attracting funds? I think it's important for just not even for the regulators, but for a lot of other fintech players looking to come up and you know trying to learn from your experience. At what point did you decide that? Look, or did you, uh, you know, realize that you had to actually, you know, get regulatory buying? Yeah, Joshua. Okay. Um, so from the very beginning, um, when we started, we actually sought um, regulatory compliance, right? So it wasn't particularly clear what we wanted to do, right? Um, we were the first in our space in this market and we were still trying to even understand the product before even going to market um, fully. So we didn't really understand what we wanted to be. Um, over the years, it became clearer. But what we found out that there was nothing we could lay our hands on in terms of, okay, this is where we should be. This is what we should um, work with. This is who we should go to. Um, there's the CBN and there's, there's the SEC. And at the time we we're struggling between trying to be a bank or trying to be an asset management company. So it wasn't really clear in the beginning. In fact, we actually did acquire a microfinance bank in the beginning. And when we raised our funding, uh, we acquired a cooperative license, a money lenders license. Again, we we're just doing everything we could at the time to be sure we were um, you know, doing what's right you know, in regulatory um, and purview. But I'll say there was not, it wasn't clear from the regulatory um, and people how companies like this should operate. So everyone, not just mm -hmm. Big Vest, other companies would go and you know get all of these things to try and just be compliant. But I'll say what needs to happen is there needs to be clarity from the regulators. Like even till now, we are now even trying to you know engage the SEC, you know, like okay said. Some of us are at the tail end of, you know, getting our own um, SEC license. But in the beginning, it wasn't clear. And it's been five years. My worry or my fear mm. is that, you know, we will continue to have, you know, webinar sessions or conferences talking about the same issues without making any significant progress. I feel that five years has gone or more than that. And there should be some framework at the moment as regards how companies coming into the space can play um there should be there should have been a lot of learnings you know from what everyone has been doing so far um i, I like what uh you know Kola said it's it's sometimes with innovation you're testing you're testing very quickly you 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 want to solve a problem and you know sometimes you might not really think about it's very different you, you, made, you made an example it's very different from trying to build a house right or set up an hospital you some things are already clear you know you want to build a house you, there are things you have to do but in our own sector it's not very clear what needs to be done you know that's why there's been a lot of issues going on and on so i i feel like there needs to be a lot of clarity for i think we've had enough time you know to provide that clarity to so even new um innovation that is yet to come 
because there is a lot more to be done. We are just basically scratching the surface where there is a lot to be done. Like there's still financial inclusion. There are still people who are banked, who are just still on the, who are still on the bank. Um, there's still a lot that can be done. And if um, there is no proactiveness from the regulators, I, I feel like we'll continue this tradition of talking about issues again and again and again and again without having something concrete. Joshua, I mean, let, still sticking on your point here, because I think you do raise a very important point um, in here. Uh, but I, I, I'm, I'm listening to you and I'm you know, going back to you know, my early days of basically trying to seek um, funding for some projects, especially, you know, outside from this was before you even had, you know, um, uh, foreign investors, you know, you invest in startups locally. Um, do you think that perhaps there is a room for, you know, maybe middle players like consultants or, you know, lawyers or financial advisors who, also need to you know understand the yearnings and the needs of, of, of the people in the fintech market because I mean to be honest um, I don't know um, you know how well, the, the way I've seen I've studied regula regulations in the past uh, they have laws they have guidelines right so you go figure them out I, I don't see anything beyond breaking that down right um, because that's what typically happens so they give you laws and then, you know, from those laws, you have guidelines and frameworks, and then somebody tries to figure those things out, out for you. I mean, that's not to say that we don't have ambiguous laws or laws that are probably um, um, obsolete, you know, but then where do you think, you know, middle players can come in to help, you know, your, your sector? For example, there are, there are accountants, there are, you know, CFA chatter holders out there, there are lawyers out there, people who should actually understand this space and perhaps advice better. Uh, are you not getting those kind of people? Are they not available for you to maybe access? Um, so honestly, what is happening right now is startups are starting to hire for those roles within their companies, right? So you have a startup who has someone who's dedicated, you know, in the startup to um, engaging I don't know if I lost you for a bit. So I said startups are basically hiring okay. for those roles. Yes, startups are basically hiring for those okay. roles today, where you have you know someone within the team whose primary objective is to engage the regulator, and while the rest you know of the team is building out, someone is. So I think there's 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 there is there is actually a role for that, and again, we're trying to be innovative about it because we cannot be building and be engaging some at the same time. So there has to be someone doing that. So yes, in, I've seen this happen even with transportation startups, um, very, very common in FinTech space where you have someone on the team who is actively um, engaging the regular. And I think that needs to continue. So I think that that actually works. All right, thanks. I'm gonna to come to you, okay. Uh, I, I mean, you've had an opportunity to listen to, to you know, a lot of the very, you know, um, um, uh, interesting comments that we've, we've had here so far um there is there is a a, a clause in in the sect act that deals with i think it was part two that deals with power and functions of the regulator and um the particular one that deals with you know regulators um you know um, um you know power to basically regulate cross border you know transactions and even uh, a lot of things that happen where's the confusion here why is it that you know, a lot of young startups or, you know, fintech players can't easily, um, you know, determine who regulates who. Uh, I mean, uh, we do know that there are, in, in, there, are, there are different layers. For example, if you're going to be participating in the capital market, uh, SEC is the viral regulator, but the Nigerian Stock Exchange also plays its own, you know, a little bit, bit of regulatory, um, you know, you know, path there. And then uh, there's also the role of, of CBN sometimes. So where, where do you think this confusion is, is, is coming from? And maybe perhaps how can SEC uh, maybe help to better make things easy? Oh, okay, thank you. Um, okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, um, Tosin, for answering the, the you know, uh, you just took it out of my mouth, what I was going to tell Kola. So thank you for that. And uh, briefly, Joshua, um, I, I would just let you know that um, sometimes that uh, seeming um, uh, not having some clarity comes from the fact that uh, we have laws that uh, sometimes do not allow us to do certain things. For instance, um, 
uh, we've had to, you know, look for ways to, like the crowdfunding uh, rules we, we call it, we had to look for ways to work within the ISA 2007. And that's why we are reviewing the ISA now. We are reviewing the ISA so that we can actually cover things that um, uh, that law does not allow us to cover. So um, we're working very hard at that now so that we can cover some of these things. But I, I, I just wanted to know that um, if you come, come into us, um, we, we, we will be able to find a way to, to you know, offer you some clarity. And I'm saying this to the entire um, um, industry. Okay, um, back to uh, Go's question. Um, there's usually no um, much confusion. Uh, as per where our, our um, regulatory responsibilities start or stop and where CBNs or what any other regulator starts and stops. And um, these, these are clear to us. They may not be clear to the market, but they are clear to us. And that's why we are saying, if you ask us, we can let you know. Um, but we, we don't regulate as an island. Um, the, the SEC is not an island. The CBN is not an island. We work together. Uh, there's the financial sector, um, the, the FSRCC, a group that um, includes all the regulators in the financial sector. And we come together to, uh, you know, regulate together. We even uh, do uh, uh, supervisions, uh, visits, and uh, all kinds of inspections uh, together. So um, th there are clear, clear lines. When whatever you're doing involves securities, investments, anything of that nature, SEC, when it involves money, payments, things like that, CBN. If you're not sure, and, and it's possible for a company to be doing something that involves both regulators. And that's why we have the FSRCC. We are able to work together to give you the necessary approvals. So there's really no uh, much uh, confusion. Uh, I, I was um, asked a question about uh, uh, why SEC was allowing the central bank to determine whether they would uh, regulate uh, crypto tokens and all that. And I made it clear. Uh, like in the statement we had in September, we said, if whatever you're doing looks like an investment, looks like an asset, looks like a capital market activity, we will regulate. But we're not going to go and regulate currencies and how they are issued or anything that has to do with monetary policy. And these things are clear to us. So um, if you approach us, we can direct you. And we are not saying that the lines are clear. And that's why we have the joint regulation. In some instances, we have the joint regulation with the CBN to take care of areas or activities where um, activities that have both uh, characteristics or both uh, features. So that's it. All right. Okay. Um, still on. Still sticking to you, though. Uh, the few. The, I think there are a few more questions I want to ask or get clear, and I'm sure uh, maybe uh, Kola Joshua or uh, Tosin would also want to chime in on some of your comments. Um, so you did mention in the, in the last segment about you know having a better relationship with with fintech associations and not necessarily you know individual individual fintechs uh, i do know that some exist um already so is there you know any flaw in the way they interact with with the regulators uh is it that maybe you know these interactions are not happening often enough or you know maybe there's some breakdown or in the representation uh, of you know those those associations or you know so what exactly uh, you know are, are, are the advantages and disadvantages or maybe let's speak to the disadvantage of the current you know way that uh, you know fintech associations interact with the regulars because I mean I kind of think that if these interactions were frequent then that education would easily pass through to other fintech uh, you know members of this association and a lot of all these things that Joshua spoke to probably won't even exist. So where are we, where's the breakdown, you know, from your own perspective? Okay. I, I concede that uh, these interactions are not as frequent as they, as they ought to be. Um, but I, I can assure you that there have been these interactions before the COVID uh, uh, lockdowns and the problems of last year. We had several uh, meetings. We had um, uh, seminars and, and things that uh, a fora where we, you know, engage the members of these associations. Um, I don't know that there's an association or for the um, for for Chaka and uh, companies like that, but I know that there's a, an umbrella um, fintech association that uh, we have uh, dealt with and who have even come. Uh, 
on one or two occasions to the SCC to have meetings. Uh, but the thing is that we want more of these engagements. We are open to more of these engagements. That's why when your um, when your invitation for this webinar came, the director general just asked me immediately to you know to 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 be a part of this panel. And and the message is we want to engage. We are ready to engage. Mm -hmm. Um, so so uh, let, let this be, uh, you know, a platform to, to, to pass this message again. Um, can we have, uh, uh, we, you know, things like what we are doing now? Uh, and also, uh, another thing I've been saying is there's nothing wrong with people, the association, these uh, firms, you know, writing things, you know, saying this is what is wrong. Like I, I just took Collada, I'm taking back some things, you know. Uh, this is what is wrong. This is what I suggest can be done. The SEC listens. That's why when That's we are making feedback, basically, we invite everyone to you know to be part of that rulemaking process. So we listen. So if you think that there's something that can be done better, put it in writing, send it to us, and I, I assure you we'll consider it. So we're ready to engage. Um, it, sometimes it comes from us. The 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 you know we initiate it, but we won't mind if you also initiate. All right. Um, okay. Let me let me also hold you on 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 this other issue. Um, so, I mean, this one concerns not just um, you know the fintech, uh, you know apps or the fintech community. It also concerns um, you know consumers or or investors or consumers of this of these applications. Uh, a few weeks back, SEC released um, you know a, a, a press release um, warning essentially. Um, I don't know how to use the word warning, but of course, telling uh, fintech operators that look, you can't allow, uh, you can't allow, you know, them have Nigerians invest in foreign securities. And I think that, um, you know, you did quote, uh, you know, the laws and uh, as it is, and 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 then you know, a few people also came up and said, look, yes, you know, you don't allow it, but there there are ways of actually investing in foreign securities. Uh, if you go through some of these maybe more established uh, fund managers or or um, um, I mean, investment, uh, you know, companies that are already SEC regulated, you know, you can, you know, buy foreign security through them. Uh, but of course, you gotta have deep pockets. You're probably, you know, maybe in the top, top two, two to five percent of Nigeria. But a lot of the people who you see here are young people who want to, you know, partake in the wealth that's been created by the likes of Tesla, Facebook. You know, they've seen these companies grow. They use them every day. They are used to it. So. But then, I mean, what's it stopping them from being a part of this of this wealth that is basically generational wealth, like you would say, that's created outside of this country? So, is there something that we, we are missing, or is sex saying, "Look, you, we, Nigerians can't just be part of this wealth, and we must just be stuck in investing in Nigerian assets"? Where's the confusion here? I mean, let's just use the opportunity to clear it out once and for all. Okay. Okay. Um, what sex okay. said? What sex said was um, that CMOs. Capital market operators registered with the SEC um, should stop um, enabling companies who are unregistered. So this goes back to what we've been talking about. If you set up shop and start doing uh, a regulated business without um, trying to get um, uh, the necessary regulatory approvals, any responsible regulator would, would say no to that. And that was say saying no to that. Sex uh, uh, statement never said, do not invest in this or do not do this or do not do that. It simply said, CMO stop enabling unregistered players in the market. I, and I think that was clear enough. That was clear. So um, the market uh, interpreted it in different ways. But I, I, let me ask, I, I know I'm not the moderator now, but let me ask, would it have been right for the SEC to let um, uh, unregistered market activities go on, or let unregistered entities engage in market activities. You see, um, we had some engagement with uh, some of these companies who uh, give uh, Nigerians access to these stocks. And some of the questions we asked were, what are the risk management uh, uh, arrangements in place? What is the arrangement around cost study? In whose names are these assets bought? You know, these are questions the regulator must ask. So what we are saying is, come in, get registered, let's know what you're doing so that we ensure that you're doing what you say you're doing. 
your 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 you you are you are um, responsible to the uh, your investors or to your clients the way you said you would be. That's what we are saying. So um, I don't see any confusion in what we said, and I think it's clear. So I, if I were an investor in uh, in foreign stocks through one of these companies, I also want someone to have my back, and that's what the SEC is doing. Hmm. Um, I, I mean, I, I hear you. I hear you. Okay, but let me just—I was just trying to read up, read out a, a part of this, a part of the the press release. I think at this here yeah. it says yeah. the commission categorically states uh, that the provision of you know section sixty-seven to seventy of the ISA uh, rules four and five and four and four and four and four and five circles and regulations only foreign securities listed on the exchange registered in Nigeria may be issued sold or offered for sale or subscription to the Nigerian public. Accordingly, CMOs who work in concert with reference online platforms are hereby notified of the commission's position and advised to desist henceforth. So I, I guess maybe this is where there was a bit of that confusion, particularly from the point of view of, you know, maybe those of us who, who also want to invest in, in foreign securities. So is SEC saying that we can't invest, you know, in those securities because they're not listed Oh, maybe you want to maybe just help clarify that part of it for us. Okay. SEC didn't say um, anybody could not invest in any security. Remember that our market, like our stock market, has historically had 40 to 50%, sometimes even more than 50% of foreign investments. So uh, it, will, it, will be, it will be difficult for us to say uh, we should not invest in, in, in countries out, uh, outside of here and then expect those ones to come and invest here. So those were, those were in the, uh, that, that wasn't the intention of the SEC. The SEC needs to know who is making these investments, how are they being made, are we protecting the investors? That's important to the SEC. Um, and that's the, the, that's the intention and that's the message we want to pass. Um, we, I, like I told you, we've already started engaging with these companies, and, and I'm sure if any of them is on this call, they can add, you, they can attest to the fact that they met with the with the with the highest levels of the SEC, and the message they went away with was not that uh, we were going to close them or we we're going to stop them or we we're going to do anything, but they must work with regulations. That's the thing. So, and I must tell you that. that um, uh, that this brings me back to something Joshua said. Uh, what usually happens is that innovation leads and regulation follows. We cannot regulate what has not started. So as fast as these uh, ideas are coming, as fast as these innovations are coming, we are also responding. We are making rules. We are making regulations. That's why Joshua was complaining that uh, sometimes we are slow. We haven't gotten to where he is. Yes, we will be slow because we have to be careful. Um, the crowdfunding rules you held at the beginning of this, uh, of this webinar took us over two years to come up with because we had to engage widely. So as these innovations are coming, we are looking at creating new rules. Uh, like uh, one of the things we have done that, that uh, the COVID the lockdown helped us to do was that we supercharged our making a, 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 a process. We, have, we, we, we did lot, tons of work on these issues and we keep doing them. So the thing is, um, we may not be as fast as you would like us to, but we must be careful what we do and we must do it right. So this is why sometimes it looks like we are slow or something, uh, but we have to get it right. That's what we are doing. So please don't read it that way. Read it that if you're not registered and you're engaged in capital market activity, come in and get registered. And as you're doing that, we are going to be coming up with regulations that protect you and also protect your clients and the customers and the uh, investors. That's what we are doing. All right. Okay. Thanks. I mean, I I, I couldn't agree agree uh, you know further. We I agree 100 that you do uh, need to have um, a lot of operators registered. I, I agree with you. But you know, what does it take to register these guys? I mean, this 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 was a press release that that came out um, you know earlier in the month. I think you know April 8th or April 9th. Uh, what will it take? To get them registered, I mean, shouldn't I mean a lot of these guys? People know them already. You know, we know these apps. They're on the app store. They are companies. They 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 are also associated with their CMOs. What will it take to register these guys in a, within a week or two? I mean, because you know, a lot of you know retail investors who also visit our metrics ask us like, is this too safe? 
to invest? What's going to happen to money? Should I still put in more? I'm already used to keeping a part of my salary and then pushing it into whether it's, it's shaka or bamboo or throw, just you know, have some kind of point uh, exposure uh, in equity. So what, what does it need to take to get this done? You know, maybe rather quickly. Okay. 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 The first thing is, um, if they want to, they can walk into the SEC. If they don't, after this webinar, go to our website. You will see a fintech assessment form. It's there. Fill the form. Send it to us, and we'll call you or we'll engage you. I can drop my number, or you can get. Uh, you can contact us uh, through the fintech uh, and innovation portal. There are numbers there. There are email addresses there, and we'll start the engagement. First, the first thing is we may not be able to do it to Godre in a week or two, as you say, because we first have to understand what the firm is doing. We first have to understand what the firm is doing. Isn't that difficult? <laughs> okay, we know what they are doing now. <laughs> <laughs> Should it be dark? I mean, I, I don't know about business. We don't know what they are doing. I need to understand what they are doing, and then I need to ask the relevant questions, like those questions I just asked: risk management, custody, and things like that, dispute resolution, and all that. I need to ask those questions and get those questions answered. So, like I told you, I can assure you that many of them are already in the process. Many okay. Okay. In the process. And I can assure you that um, we, we the, the office has a mandate to quicken these things. The office has a mandate to quicken it. But uh, from what I'm hearing now, even that um, what we think is quick is not even quick. So we are going to keep uh, trying to improve. I have taken note of this. I, I can assure you that on Tuesday, I'm going to uh, pass this on to the office that the market thinks that they are slow. So I'm going to do that. That's what I'm hearing. So I'm going to do that. Um, and I, I want to assure every one of these firms and the promoters that please feel free to come in. You can quote me, you can take my number, you can take uh, my email address. You can come and say that uh, you said we we're going to make it easy for you to come in, quote me. So that's what we want. Please come in and let's get these, uh, these regulations going. All right, guys, you heard okay here. We're ready to engage. Feel free to come in. Um, we've taken your feedback. Uh, intention of sex is not to stop Nigerians from investing abroad. I mean, we've heard a lot of nuggets already from okay. Uh, I'm sure Kola is salivating, and uh, we're just going to segue straight away into the third uh, part of this uh, interesting webinar so far, if you ask me, uh, fostering a business-friendly ecosystem. That's the next um, section of this of this webinar. I'll call her, uh, I mean, you've listened to everyone. You've been listening to uh, Tosi, uh, you know, Joshua, and and okay, uh, and I hope that I was able to at least draw out a lot of uh, you know answers. You know, you probably don't want to ask okay from, from him. Um, you know, you 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 are very well. You know, you've got a lot of stake in in this industry. Uh, for a lot of people who don't know, for years, for years, and you've been basically trying to. You know, help people create stuff. Um, what are the challenges? You know, founders. You know that, especially the ones that you've spoken. And I've had an opportunity to also speak to some of some of you know members of your you know founders community as well. You know, what kind of challenges are they facing? And and you know, how can you basically? You know, what recommendations can you make to SAC to make things better? You've heard okay already. Okay, so give me feedback. I'm willing to take all the feedback. You know that you can send to the other. I think he's he's basically committed to a few. So I think is there something missing here? Like Perhaps maybe from another country. Uh, one, like one of my friends uh, would say, if he, I'm sure you know him very well. He says that if there's one thing Europe is very good at, it's exporting regulations. So are there any maybe uh, examples out there that we perhaps we can also share with SEC so that, you know, maybe these things can be faster, right? Rather than just have this. Because like you said, innovation is light speed. It just goes on and around. People just want to get things. Like for me, I'm like, by now, it should have basically just approved Chaka, Trove, and this guy. We know them already now. You know what I mean? Like, what should it take? Just get these guys approved so that we know that these are the, these are the, these are the guys there. So what can, can SEC do from your point of view, Kola? And you're experiencing also. Let's, let's hear you. Thank you, Ugo. Um, I'm going to section my response into three sections. The first section will attempt to respond to some of the things that have been said. The second would attempt to give some examples, and the third would attempt to speak to what the what the what the startups are, are saying and a few suggestions. So I think the last segment really really addressed the challenge with the approach that was utilized. For the for Chaka Trove and but with the secular. So first of all, if we want to be really honest, the secular went further than okay suggested, right, in his remarks, uh, because there's the point really that that 
that give the impression that investing in foreign securities for Nigerians was against the law. Let's, and I don't think that was the intention. But wrapped up in that really is the fact that these seculars, I mean, they work, I think they work in a, 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 in a forgotten era, an era where, mm. you know, you needed to send a letter to a bank headquarters. And so the fastest way to get the information out was to put out a circular that all the newspapers would put on their headlines. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Uh, much faster than sending an email. But today, you literally can send an email to all the operators to say, guys, we, we, we're going to shut you down, but, but come, come and meet with us over the next five days, for instance, right? The challenge that that creates, it, and that challenge is further worsened if you are not prepared to respond quick enough. So now the, the circular went out, the company's already engaging, but we still don't have, the, it's not like the, 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 you know, the question you asked, why is it taking so long? Right is is you would expect that if we're going to do that, then we're if our, as long as our intention is not to disrupt the market, then you would almost assume that we will be much more faster to get into a solution. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying, Ugo. Um, I I am personally strongly opposed to those type of uh, brute force approaches that create shock in the mm -hmm. market and just. And honestly, do damage to our investment climate, right? Because these companies today are largely being supported by foreign and local investors that are taking risks. I mean, in, uh, like Adventures Platform Fund, we're invested in a lot of these companies, and our own investors are concerned that look, why is there so much uncertainty in your market? So, so I really wanted, I really want to just address that. The second thing I want to address is, okay, I'm not saying that the startup should never come to the SEC. What I'm saying is that at the very early stage, they don't even know what they're trying to solve. So take PiggyVest, for instance. At the end, I mean, as an investor in PiggyVest, I'm aware at the early stage, we weren't clear if we we're going to be a bank, if we we're going to a new bank, we we're going to be a wealth management company. So what, who do you go to? What are you, when you go, what are you saying? So I think at the earliest stage, and it's great that Tosi and Chaka and a couple of the other guys went straight to the regulator. Maybe they were clear on what they wanted to do, but it's not always the case. In, case, in fact, the most cutting edge innovation would not have a regulator today, right? Um, and it will be very difficult to fit those innovations. I mean, um, you talked about the, the um, I, I think a piece of policy that allows both the CBN and the SEC to jointly sort of regulate. But from what I'm hearing, that 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 policy, um, the ISA, is is the is, FRCC. Yeah, it's is a two thousand. I think he called it the FRCC. It's a two thousand and seven piece of law, if I'm correct, and the market has moved significantly from that, right? So, so it's the pace of this innovation seems to be moving faster than the regulatory landscape. Now, to to the second point on um, what sort of the market is saying. So, I think first of all, the market is saying. SEC, thanks. I mean, we really appreciate the approach, but we can do better. And I think that they are, I'm going to put what the what, what the startups are saying, and I can't speak for all the startups, but the startups that I talk to at least. Uh, one is their concerns with the how, right? Uh, and I, I spoke to that extensively already. This fintech ecosystem should cannot, it shouldn't, you know, their concerns about how the regulators are going about the regulation. And we talked extensively about circulars that create panic, right? Because don't forget these startups are managing investors, users, all sorts of stakeholders, right? So the how of the regulation, I think is one big challenge. There's also concerns about the what, right? Who is the regulator? Who should we be engaging with? I think there's need for more cohesion and more sort of clarity uh, uh, from all the regulators across the fintech landscape, right? Um, particularly now, we have we already have a first and second wave of innovations. I mean, you had the payment companies like Paystack. Today, you're now having the likes of PVest, Chaka and Co. We can almost anticipate where the market is going to go to next. So can we start having progressive regulation, for instance, uh, uh, that, that is sort of forward looking? I think the, 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 the third bucket of concern is really the why. There is a false impression out there 
that the regulator is looking to stifle innovation, right? And I think that needs to be corrected very quickly because if that is not corrected, what you are going to see is that capital is going to move to other markets, right? Um, and so the question folks are asking is why? why? Why does it seem like since January, 2021, you know, fintechs have had, have had to basically be on alert, right? What, what are we truly optimizing for? What is the point of all of this? I think is, is, is the third bucket. So again, how, um, there's concerns about the how of regulation, there's concerns about the what of regulation, there's concerns about the why, you know, what, what are the regulators truly looking to optimize for? And I think we're all asking ourselves a question. What would happen if we took, if the regulators took a different approach, right? Um, to say, look, as opposed to, you know, trying to protect, you know, or, or trying to limit or trying to set guardrails, I actually want to see this market accelerate, right? Wouldn't, the question folks are asking is, wouldn't that create a much better outcome for Nigeria, for the regulators and for everyone, right? And so in terms of what a few suggestions as to what can happen, I think first of all, there's need, I mean, if we want to be very honest, what got us here won't get us further. So in the beginning of my remarks, I already, I already commended the SEC and the CBN because I think we won't be where we are today without their, 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 their progressive approach. I mean, we have one of the most robust fintech ecosystems in Africa and, and, and in the emerging markets for lack of better words. However, we have to realize that the market has moved. And so there's need for the regulators to take a more, a more, a, a very different mindset, realizing that this is the, this is the best show in town, right? This FinTech ecosystem is the best show in town. So we need to move from worrying about protecting it to really thinking about how we can accelerate it, right? You know, and I wish I had time, but I'd love to share a conversation with a central banker in the Baltic region where he spoke about his philosophy, the, the, the governor of one of the central banks in that, in that region. And, you know, really, really different mindsets to what we're seeing in our own markets, where you understand that this is your best chance at truly, truly growing your market. The second thing that I think can happen is those of us in the private sector would love to get more engaged either as expert groups or advice or advisors Right, because I think there's a need to sort of understand the mindset of the innovator and, and, the, and the investor in the innovator. I think that can really help to ensure that these policies and these regulations are more market sensitive. Right, so are there, could, could there be private sector expert groups or advisory groups? Obviously, you know, they're not going to be decision makers, but they can, they can help, they can support that, that process of policy formulation and regulation. The third suggestion I'd like to uh, bring up, again, sandboxes. We've heard that time and time again, but we need to move from just saying we're doing sandboxes to actually building the sandboxes and actually implementing them, right? Uh, because they can help, uh, okay, particularly at that early stage where the company doesn't really know what they're doing. They're still experimenting and testing. And it's a good source of data for the regulator as well. Uh, finally, I think like the SEC has already done, we, we need to continue utilizing these notice and comment processes, you know, like was done brilliantly in the crowdfunding, uh, on the crowdfunding matter where, you know, so the regulator, and I, even the CBN has done this, where the regulator releases a, either a draft policy. A draft exposure. A, a draft exposure for people to comment and gives enough time for comments and actually takes the comments. That's really how you get progressive. But I think the starting point is a change in mindset. When we realize how urgent this situation is, that look, if we don't support these innovations, we're going to struggle because these innovations are the best show in town today. Thank you very much, Ugo. I think, I think um, I, 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 I'm grateful that- All right, Kola, I just hang, hang in there. I'm sure there are a few questions that, you know, from the participant that you probably would uh, would address and you know thanks for that for the, for the brilliant brilliant um, 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 comments. I, I do know though that um, you know I, I, if I'm not mistaken, um, you know the CBN has 
uh, what you call its financial inclusion roadmap. There's been they've been very upfront around where they want to take financial inclusion to dating back, uh, you know, to even before uh, Sulubo. I think to the very first Sanusi, uh, you know, CBN government. They've had that all along, and and I think that's basically what they've been implementing all through. So maybe perhaps perhaps okay. Um, I, I guess the, the message here is that maybe we need to see some kind of regulatory roadmap. Uh, for this prospect in terms of where we're going to. Uh, we know that innovation is, is typically very light speed, uh, but innovation, you know, got to gotta catch up uh, at some point. Uh, I don't know whether you have any response to, um, you know, to, to call If you don't, then I can just quickly toss in, uh, you know, right away. I mean, Kola did made a lot of, you know, a lot of suggestions. Um, you know, I don't know. Do, okay, do you want to respond quickly to Kola or do I go to Tosin? Yeah, I, I, no, there's no response. I think Kola made uh, suggestions and uh, I've taken them and uh, we we'll look at them. Taking notes of them. All right, all right. Fantastic, fantastic. Okay, so, Tosin, I'm going to come to you next. Um, you know, um, there are there are benefits. Uh, I think you and I know um, uh, of, of of operating in a regulatory environment. Um, I mean. <laughs> If for nothing, I want to be sure that you know where I'm putting my money into is sort of like you know guaranteed, well, maybe not guaranteed, but at least um, scrutinized, right? Um, if I today get up and go and open a a, 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 a build one fancy building and put Ugodre Bank, I don't think anybody's going to come and deposit money in there uh, because it's not something you've heard of, you know, from a regulatory standpoint. So, but then. Uh, maybe for for the fintech community and a lot of a lot of Nigerians who are young and looking to come on board, what exactly um, you know what are those advantages or benefits of having you know regulators uh, basically you know you know at least acknowledging you know fintech guys and then maybe this could also perhaps maybe help regulators better understand why it's important for them to immediately start to register these guys right I mean remember what I told okay like come in let's do this quickly. Right, so let us understand why do we need regulators to to at least acknowledge fintech operators, not just uh, you know uh, because you need to stick to some kind of process, but do it quickly. Yeah, no, uh, you know, and the parallel I'll draw is still the same one from health and aviation. I think doing it quickly requires understanding it, and then you know systematizing that process so that you get just the right things that you need from that SEC understanding exactly what is going on in the market. I think the confident as they, I think SEC, SEC, SEC would probably do quite a bit to, to, to go further on that. And I would expect that, you know, the first license of any kind may take a while, but the 10th may, may be quicker or the 100th may be quicker. So, um, you know, depending on how big and how, how, how much practice and repeats you've done in understanding the parameters there. Um, I think the main benefits of being under the regulator has to do with confidence and security and scale. Um, so, you know, when you just start up, it's it's exciting, um, both for the operators and for the, the customers. Um, but as you layer on and you grow and you get scale, or you wanna distribute in a way that you're dealing with, you know, business compliance departments. So for example, we provide digital investing tools for other brokers and other asset managers and, and, and co, just the digital tools. Um, as you scale up, they wanna know you're compliant. Um, so it's actually becomes a question, what is your status? Um, and it's pretty binary answer when you're dealing with businesses or other people who are partners to be able to enable these innovations to impact the market. For direct customers, I think it's just to know the long term, your money safe. You spoke about people asking you questions. I think with regulation coming out and, 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 uh, and clearing that up, then moving forward, people, those same people will know where they stand and will be like, okay, I can now plan for five years or 10 years knowing this, this is something I can, I can uh, um, um, put my hat on. Um, I think the disadvantage of, of uh, not having regulation or it being open-ended or in question is obviously the uncertainty. So I, I really think certainty is what it's about, whether it's our approach is we're not gonna regulate this or approaches we're gonna regulate this. Um, so I think the certainty allows everyone to build forward from there. Um, I think some other things that are just um, benefits for being uh, regulated as well is the ability to collaborate to bring innovations to market faster, like, you, like you've mentioned. Yeah. Um, let's just assume there was a company that had done this two years ago um, and had gone through all this regulations two years ago. It would be easier for everybody else two years later. So um, I think the, the, the being regulated provides, provides uh, 
you know, easier, easier on ramps for others who may want to come in uh, and for the growth of that ecosystem. Um, so, uh, you know, if you're putting in a million naira or 10 million naira, 100,000 naira, 1 billion, you know, no matter the scale, depending on how much you feel that that money is, is something that, that is very important to you, you will get more confidence if you know that money is safe and stable. I don't think there's anybody who would argue with that. So that, that's what I see as the, the main benefits is the ability to bring innovations to markets, you know, in collaboration, knowing that um, they'll be compliant, the ability to partner and allow that those innovations to be to be to be distributed and to work with um, other other players, you know, because in the end, it is about uh, improving the market access for for everyone, not just through one provider. Um, and uh, lastly, about being able to scale, right? So, you know, you, even, you, you, we all know this, even some businesses reach a scale when they're not unregulated that they start begging for regulation because they know that it's too risky not to have it, whether it's, you know, Coinbase. Not to have regulations. Yeah, in the US, you know, people talk a lot about their, their disruption innovation, but, you know, I see it more as uh, less disruption and more enabling, enabling. Yes, you know, crypto may disrupt and, and whatnot, and each country has their own view. But if you look at a Coinbase, just as a company, in a, they were in a traditionally unregulated space and they engaged to become regulated and help define regulations that now power others who are also companies that work. So I think there is a time element to this where obviously we want everything solved immediately, but I, I'm very bullish on the long term. And you know, in the short term, there might be some volatility with, with how, like, 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 like the points Colin has brought up about you know, um, um, modes of engagement and, 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 and releases. But you know, long term, I'm definitely bullish that uh, being, having regulation and being regulated is more beneficial uh, uh, for the markets to be able to scale. All right. Thanks a lot for that, Tosi. Uh, I mean, I think that uh, you were on a Google call on this. Uh, it's more beneficial uh, to have some kind of regulation. I think it's important that we are in a regulated market, no matter what. Nobody wants, you don't want rogue players coming in here and coming to destroy everything that you built, uh, and you know, especially when it comes to regulation and, and for things like this. Uh, Sorry, just, 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 just one, one more thing to just mention is that, you know, I, I did see the circular like everybody else in, you know, two weeks or three weeks prior, we did put out a statement talking about the engagements we've had with SEC and uh, a new license mm -hmm. coming out. And so, you know, my interpretation has always been, been uh, just like Mr. O'Case about the need to be registered. And, you know, I've, I've, I've also evangelized that, that it's really about, about that, um, to try to also clear up um, some misunderstandings. So uh, just wanted to make that. All right, all right. Thanks for chiming in. And, and, and so I'm gonna to come to you next, Joshua. Um, uh, something that people have, have often asked me as well, um, mostly with agritech, agritech apps. Uh, I mean, but uh, I mean, I, I want to just speak to this from at least uh, 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 an industry player point of view. Um, we talked about the role of regulators in terms of you know either uh, enabling you know this space or protecting you know investor money and things like that. Uh, but from a, 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 a player itself, like 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 uh, like Piggyvest. What kind of assurances do you give, you know, users of your products, right? Um, in terms of maybe the risk of putting their money in Piggyvest uh, or risk of investing in any other fin app or maybe using Piggyvest to facilitate other kind of investment. How am I sure that, you know, if I have that money in there, it's probably protected, it's going to come back to me. We don't, we don't, let's even assume that we are doing this in a world where there are no regulators. Right, because we've got technology now, and, and it's, it's pretty much easy to verify about things. So, what you know, are you guys doing, you know, from a transparency point of view, uh, to make this easier for for your users, Joshua? Okay. Um, so, one of the issues we face today as Piggyvest is the fact that a lot of people want to invest, and they don't see a lot of they don't see investment opportunities to invest in. And it becomes a problem because they're like, when is Piggyvest going to bring the next investment? You know, it stays sold out for months and months and months. And, you know, when we see those things, we understand them, but it is part of the reasons we do what we do. We cannot put out investments we are not sure of. We have a robust due diligence team that actually goes as deep as visiting the farms to ensure that our customers are protected. So we, this is something we don't take very lightly at all. We have built brand equity over the years that 
we know can go to shit over very, very tiny issues. So we take those things extremely, very, very, very seriously. So it, it's not about the lack of you know, investments. It is the, what are the options that are available out there that are safe? Because whatever, it has, it has come to a point where whatever Piggy Vest tells its customers to invest in, they will. And because we have that yeah. trust from our customers, we do not want to just tell them anything just because, oh, they are craving for investments. So we take our time yeah. very well. That's something we don't even, we don't play. We take our time very well to ensure that everything we're putting out is extremely safe. Also, in terms of um, like, because there are there are there are there are there are fintech you know um, challenges everyone faces, but I'd say in terms of the app, we have we also have one of the most robust internal fraud detection system, right? Um, with fintech comes you know a lot of fraud, the banking industry, whatever whatever it is, there's a lot of fraud going on. But the team over the years has been able to build, I, I dare say, the most robust internal fraud detection, detection um, system. So again, we take security at PiggyVest very, very seriously. Our, you know, whatever the case is, we are always you know, there to listen to what the complaints are and provide solutions as fast as possible. And I say it's a lot of work, you know, but it's work that we must do because we're talking about people's money. And we must protect them as much as we're trying to protect the company. So these things exist, but you know, in terms of um, trying to make sure that our customers are protected, I think we do quite a lot in that area. A lot of those things are understated, and maybe one day we'll start to write about all of the things we do. But due diligence is extremely, extremely key for us. Fantastic. I mean, and I, 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 I would encourage that you do write a lot about these things. Uh, we do see it from a lot of foreign foreign apps abroad. You see them, they have a very, very um, um, robust blog page um, that is, you know, very well updated about a lot of the good stuff they are doing. So it'd be nice to see that happen. And I think it's important for a lot of our participants here to know that, look, there's a lot of diligence that goes into even recommending an investment for you, uh, whether it be even a, an equity investment or uh, an investment in some agri-tech space. It's just important that you have diligence. I'm going to come to you next, okay, uh, you know, before we round up. We have a lot of questions here. Uh, but what we're going to do is take on a lot of it. We would uh, at some point get you to respond to some of these questions and then have them, uh, you know, we'll have it um, kind of like, uh, you know, published on the MX. But, but okay, um, you know, recently um, the CBN um, basically, you know, banned banks from accessing cryptocurrencies. Uh, or, or facilitating cryptocurrencies. I, you know, I was going to ask you this question anyway. So, and I, 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 I've spoken to some of some people higher up in the CBN, and they sort of shifted the ball, the goalpost. Like, well, I mean, like, you know, we, we're not saying don't invest in cryptocurrencies, but, you know, SEC hasn't put out anything uh, that has said that this is some kind of investment that we can do. So, for that reason, um, you can't basically. You know, we can allow banks facilitate such, such such transactions. And I've spoken to somebody, some people in the CBN high up, and they've also sort of echoed the same sentiment. Um, I don't know anywhere in this world, maybe maybe one or two countries. So let me let me don't say the There probably maybe you know a handful of countries. I can count on my fingers that their CBN um, you know allows cryptocurrency. In fact, I don't know any. But we do know that there are countries, and particularly in the US, where you know. The currencies are regulated by SEC already. So they kind of they, they sort of see it as mm -hmm. some kind of commodity, at least in the first place, because they know that there's the billions of dollars going in there. And so there's some kind of regulatory protection. Right. Now, uh, we've seen SEC, and SEC mm -hmm. hasn't really come out to make any you know pronouncements or regulations around, you know, or maybe guidance around, you know, like cryptocurrencies and what it means for a lot of young Nigerians to invest in that space. A lot of them invest in this space. And it's basically an ecosystem of some sort now. There's different value chains that have been created. Whether you're the one mining or whether you're the one investing or whether you're the one writing about it or whether you're educating, there's just an entire uh, you know, value, value chain being created. So, so, okay, maybe help a lot of our participants here. What is the position of SEC when it comes to regulating cryptocurrency at the moment. I mean, I know that it's a moving, it's a move, it's still working progress, but maybe just let them hear you. Okay. 
Okay, um, I, I think our release of September 2020 was very clear. We said if uh, it's uh, uh, crypto tokens or anything that has to do with investments, you know, uh, in the cryptocurrency uh, area that we would um, re regulate. We released something classifying the assets and, and that was very clear. It's still there on our website. Um, however, we were forced to make another release after the CBN's one. Um, and that one was to the effect that for those uh, entities who can no longer operate bank accounts in Nigeria, we cannot um, uh, engage them, we cannot uh, regulate them, that we will no longer continue with what we planned uh, as it regards just the entities who can no longer operate uh, accounts. So we have a, a statement from September classifying cryptocurrencies and how we were going to regulate them. It's on our website. We had another statement in February in response to CBN zone saying that for those who cannot operate uh, bank accounts, we cannot continue with them. Uh, and that's very clear. How do we really regulate uh, an exchange, for instance, that cannot operate bank accounts in Nigeria? And, and that statement clearly said that we will continue with all other plans we had for regulating the fintechs. So those two statements are, in our, are on our website and clearly clarify our, our point of view. Then um, in several uh, forums and uh, uh, you know, uh, engagements with uh, different people in the market, we have said that we will engage with CBN to see, study the, you know, their concerns, study uh, the, the, the area and know how best to regulate. And I also didn't see, you know, Nigerians have been saying that CBN banned cryptocurrencies. I, I always try to, you know, correct that. They just said that banks should not enable it. They should not, uh, should close accounts of, you know, exchanges and, and all that. CPN um, is not daft. They, they know that there's peer-to-peer -peer trading going on. They know there are other ways people have uh, gotten a, around this. So um, when people say it's a ban, if it was a ban, then it would be uh, an offense to even trade it at all. And I, I don't know that CBN wants to do that. I'm not speaking for CBN, I, I, you know, I'm just saying that uh, we must uh, uh, partition this, we must, um, uh, uh, keep it the way it should be. We, we must say what is the, the, the reality. From sex point of view, our September release classifying cryptocurrencies stands. Our February release saying that there's no confusion, just that our regulation requires that people who we regulate should have bank accounts. And these people don't have bank accounts, so we can no longer continue with them, stands. Okay, so so okay, are there people who have bank accounts today in this space that you regulate? Do they exist? At least from the point of view of sex? No, no, no. You know, that um, statement of September was to, you know, elicit a response from the market. It was for people who mm. are in that, like the exchanges and all that, to come in for regulation. It's like what we've been saying since uh, we started. Sometimes um, it, it may be difficult to expect that the regulator will go after companies and, you know, you are doing this, come in, you are doing that, come in. What we do is like what I'm doing right now, saying if you're doing this and it's a regulated activity, come in. We're ready to speak with you. We haven't seen any come. So that's the thing, but that, but that statement is there and stands, and we are ready to work with anyone who comes in. But it's not, I, I don't see it as- so, well. Okay, okay, sorry. So yeah. what, what, should, what should come first? If today I want to set up a cryptocurrency exchange and yeah. allow Nigerians, you know, participate in cryptocurrency, do I need to open a bank account first or do I need to seek for regulatory license or approval? What, what comes first before I then go to, to maybe start to open the bank account. Because if I go to a bank account, you, know, you don't want to open a bank account now. Go on, go on, go you, on. Know, you know, Kola uh, touched on this about innovation preceding regulation. And and uh, in the chat, yes. I, you know, I, I quickly went through the chat. Somebody was saying, was asking why SEC uh, and the regulators generally usually wait. We know that sometimes, like uh, has been said in this uh, forum, that sometimes uh, the person who is even doing it doesn't even know where the destination is. The person is just trying and trying and you know, innovating along the way. So we recognize that. And that's why it looks like we are slow. Somebody was asking me, why did it take us two, two years or three years to respond? We recognize that we want these companies to succeed and we want them to test out what they are doing. 
but it does not mean that they don't have the responsibility to come in to get registered. So to your question, sometimes we allow this. I mean, the, the exchanges, before the CBN closed their accounts, they, they've been here for years. They've been here for years. It's not like we didn't know they were there. We knew. So what we expect is you've started this thing, you've tested it, you know, you have, you've proven your concept. Seek regulation because you're in a regulated business. That's what we're saying. We would even prefer that you come first to the regulator. That's what it should be. But we know, we recognize that sometimes it doesn't work that way because the person just starts dabbling with one thing or the other and ends up somewhere. We recognize that. The right thing is come. But, 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 yeah. Yeah. but, but okay, what, why does having a bank account, not having a bank account? Because, I mean, you, just, I mean, you mentioned that the CBN have probably closed their bank accounts and all that. Yeah. Why does having a bank account, or why should it precede you know, maybe getting some kind of uh, approval from SEC. Why should that come first? Okay, so um, like I said before, we are responding to these innovations. Right now, our regulatory, our, our um, approval process requires that there will be capital. There will be verification of that capital. That's in the approval process. So when you're registering, one of the okay, things okay. we have is that you have capital. There's verification of that. We can't do that with our bank accounts. Um, as to whether we will change that, that can happen in the future. But for now, today, as it stands, the way we do it, we can't do it with our bank accounts. Hmm. So, so, okay, where do you see, so is there at some point going to be some kind of parley between the CBN and, 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 and SEC? At least you did mention the, uh, I think you called it the, 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 the FFRCC or something. Is there going to yeah. be some kind of parley at some point to maybe put a little bit of, you know, um, transparency around these issues or clarity around these issues? Because to be honest, though, okay, I mean, I, I, there are, you know, there is a case out there. And I, and I think you do know that there is a case for, you know, regulating cryptocurrency assets. I mean, like, uh, we might not want it now, but I don't think it's something that the world is going to run away from anytime soon. And you've yeah. seen a lot of other countries, you know, basically provide some kind of guidance around how their citizens would in, invest in cryptocurrency assets. And uh, there is also an opportunity for Nigerians as well, either through ICUs or through innovation too. So where are we going to see movement around the CBN and SEC, basically having some kind of, you know, coalition and having, you know, guidelines that can help people better, better understand uh, where you stand in terms of, um, you know, regulating cryptocurrency assets. Okay. Um, I, I can tell you that that has already started, uh, even at the highest levels. And uh, it's something uh, we take seriously. I, I, my message to the, to the industry is that um, we take uh, the opportunities these uh, fintechs pr present seriously, and we're already engaging. Like our statement said, we are engaging with CBN and other stakeholders. It's not only CBN, there are other stakeholders. In fact, these engagements preceded these uh, statements. So these engagements are directed at understanding the implications of these things, understanding the risks, understanding the issues, and putting in the right regulations. This might take a little time. I don't know how much time. I wish we could come up with regulations on Tuesday. I wish so. But um, I want to assure that we're working on this. We're working on this. We are ready to engage. We are engaging. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Unfortunately, uh, this was meant to be a two-hour session. Uh, we'd like to keep uh, to that two hours. There's a lot of questions, okay? And if you don't mind, uh, we will put some of those questions together for you uh, and then maybe have you respond in writing and then we'll have it published on our metrics for a lot of our readers to read. And we'll send emails out as well to everyone who's participated. And of course, uh, you know, call out to see uh, and Joshua. Uh, there are questions directed at you as well. And, you know, if you don't mind, we'll have you respond so that we can share it. Everyone, we have the email address of everyone who, who has participated and we'll share with them. Thank you so much. I don't know if there's any final you know statements from, from you, closing remarks. Uh, brief closing remarks. I'll start with you, Paula, quickly. Just closing remarks before we close. From you. My, my, my only closing remark is to say thanks, okay, for joining us and for the very progressive stand of the SEC. And we look forward to really working with you more as we try to advance uh, this ecosystem for God and for country. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kola. Uh, we come to you, Tosin. Closing remarks? Yeah, you know, just echo exactly what Kola said. And also thank you, Ugo, for, some, uh, for arranging this panel. 
um, you know, for us, we're always very, very committed to, to doing things uh, in alignment with the market. So um, I think this panel is exactly the right kind of spirit to bring all parties together. Fantastic. Joshua, closing your remark? Yeah, pretty much the same thing. Uh, excited to do this. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. OK, for joining us here. And it's a very, very big deal to have you on board. So looking forward to doing more great stuff with the SEC. Thank you. All right, great thank stuff. Um, OK, yeah, close your remarks for me. Thank, thank you, Go and the Naira Metrics team. Thank you, um, Kola, Tosin, and Joshua. Um, I, I, I want to assure everyone that uh, we will not stifle innovation. Uh, we will um, work, we are progressive. Thank you for calling us progressive, Joshua. We are, we are glad to hear that. And we are ready to work to make sure that uh, uh, Nigeria doesn't lose the opportunities that uh, FinTech presents. All right, thank you so much. So Janet, over to you. That's it from me. Uh, I've done my bit, my part. Uh, so over to you for the final closure uh, of this uh, amazing discussion that we've had so far. And of course, thanks to the Dimetrics team for putting this together. Uh, Janet, over to you. Okay, thank you everyone for joining. Thank you, Tosin, Kola, Okay, Joshua. This was an amazing session. I learned a lot. Like Okay said, your yeah, doors are always open if you have questions, if you need guidance. Thank you everyone for joining this session and I wish you a wonderful weekend and happy Workers' Day. Thank you.